Are we okay? Okay. Fine. Great. So we can begin. So uh, this first class is an introduction to the agenda of the course. And the way in which I propose to introduce it today is by addressing the nature of the contrast between the right and the left, the conservatives and the progressives. Now, as we all know, this is a troubled con contrast. And many people think it no longer makes sense. But I think it has to be reconstructed rather than abandoned. And in this first class, uh, I want to address this contrast in two ways. First, as it were, from the top as a theoretical or philosophical opposition. And second, from the bottom, circumstantially, in historical context, as a critique of what is now, by default, the position of the progressives in much of the world. And I'm going to stop many places along the way and ask for your engagement. But whenever you want to speak, just raise your hand as well. And I'll call on you at an opportune moment. So the ideological contest in the world is now shaped in the form of an opposition between what you could call shallow equality and shallow freedom. According to this view of the ideological contest, the conservatives are the ones who accord priority to freedom. Within the established institutional arrangements, 
And the progressives are the ones who give priority to equality within those same arrangements, the institutional arrangements that define the market economy, representative democracy, and an independent civil society. So by calling this a contrast between shallow freedom and shallow equality, I mean to call attention to the shared presupposition, which is conformity to the established or inherited institutional arrangements. That seems to be now in the world the dominant view of what distinguishes the progressives from the conservatives. Uh, and this view, I want to argue, does not make sense. We have a reason to repudiate it, to reshape it. Now, is this what the progressive cause is about? More equality within the established institutional arrangements. A clue to the implications of this interpretation of the contrast between right and left lies in the theories of distributive justice that have become ascendant in the English-speaking countries like the Rawlsian theory of justice. These theories combine a profession of egalitarian faith with an institutional conservatism or agnosticism. And what happens when you sum up the two elements in this proposal? the egalitarian commitment and the institutional resignation, the acceptance of the institutional setting. What happens is that the content of the egalitarian commitment is reduced in practice to an effort at retrospective and compensatory redistribution by progressive taxation on the one hand and by redistributive social spending or social entitlements on the other hand. And this, uh, although it is stated in the form of a philosophical abstraction, is in fact a very concrete, a very homely political compromise. The point of this interpretation of the distinction between the progressives and the conservatives is to say the progressives accept the established institutional arrangements, and in particular the established form of the market order, which they recognize to be a machine for the creation of wealth, but they propose to humanize it. The progressives are the ones who put a human face on the proposal of their conservative adversaries. They want to make the market order in particular less savage in its social consequences. And before going any further into this philosophical speculation, one might observe that this is a losing position in politics. Because in general, the force that in politics determines the direction or the shape of the agenda is the force that most credibly represents the cause of creative energy, of innovation, of construction, of dynamism. And the other force, the force which appears on the scene as 
the humanizer of the inevitable is then cast in the losing position. So that's the significance of the addition of these two elements, the egalitarian commitment and the institutional conformity. Now, what then would be the alternative to this contrast of shallow freedom and shallow equality? One might say deep equality. What would deep equality be? Deep equality would be if we had an absolute commitment to an egalitarian redistribution trumping all else. For example, we impose absolute limits on the accumulation of, of, of capital, of property. Or in an agrarian society, on the acquisition of land. Restraints on alienation. And every time that inequality became too great, we would have a superior redistributive mechanism that would cancel it out. And this is, in fact, the model of many imaginary political constructions, a mythical idea of the Roman Republic or of ancient Sparta. But it doesn't seem to be a description of any form of life that anyone actually wants. So what is it that the progressives wanted? Not the contemporary ones who have resigned themselves to this position of the humanization of the inevitable, but they are precursors. The liberals and socialists of the 19th century. It seems that what they really wanted was a greater life for the ordinary man and woman, the ascent of human life to a higher plane of intensity, of scope, of capability. And the opposition to inequality, to entrenched forms of inequality, was subservient to this larger goal. Because an extreme and entrenched inequality would be incompatible with this ascent. A shared bigness was the real aim of the progressives historically, thinking now in particular of the 19th century. So one could pose the question, is it natural for human life to be small? And on this view, the conservatives are the ones who say, yes, it is natural. It will be small, except for an elite of heroes, of inventors, of entrepreneurs, of saints. Or except in those extraordinary moments of national emergency, and in particular of war, in which the mass of ordinary people is drawn up, is drawn out of the rut of the long littleness of life into some form of sacrificial devotion to goals higher than themselves. It is natural on this view for human life to be small. And the progressives would be the ones who would say, no, it is not natural for human life to be small. We can ascend. And if we are to ascend, we can ascend only together. 
So here we have a first fundamental opposition of views. Now, it's incomplete because I have neglected the other element, which is the institutional presupposition, the assumptions about the established structure. And by the structure, I mean the formative institutional arrangements and ideological assumptions of a society. Do we take those arrangements as given, as our historical fate, or do we look beyond them? Now here there is a complication for the leftists or the progressives. And the complication is that the single greatest intellectual influence on the left in the last two centuries has been classical European social theory. And in particular, Karl Marx's theory of society and history. And Karl Marx had this idea that the structures of society are our invention. They are artifacts. We made them. And they acquire then a false semblance of naturalness and necessity, as if they were part of the furniture of the universe rather than being our own creation. But this insight into the made and imagined character of social life, of its structures, of its institutional arrangements, was in Marxism circumscribed and compromised by three sets of assumptions. First, the idea that there is a closed list of regimes or types of social, political, and economic organization, an exhaustive list. This is what you could call the closed list assumption. The second assumption is that each of these regimes, the modes of production, as Marx called them, slave society, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, is an indivisible system which changes all at once or not at all. And from this assumption of indivisibility, there follows a binary idea of politics. Politics is either reformist or revolutionary. It is either the management of one of these indivisible regimes, or it is the revolutionary substitution of one by another. And then the third assumption that circumscribed this idea that the structures of social life are made and imagined is the historical laws assumption. There are laws governing the foreordained succession of these regimes in history. And if there are laws, it doesn't make sense to assume that we can form a programmatic project, a program about alternatives. Because this would be a kind of voluntarism. We don't need a program, ultimately, because history has a program in store for us. Now, this was this system that I've just described in a simplifying and radical manner. 
uh, without softening it in any way, was, was and to some extent remains the single greatest intellectual influence on the left throughout the world. And there is a problem. The problem is that the three assumptions that I stated, the closed list assumption, the indivisibility assumption, and the historical laws assumption are all false. Not only are they all false, but they are manifestly false. And we all have trouble in believing them. So there is a vocabulary that the progressives have, that the left has, which acquires its meaning from these social theoretical assumptions. And we continue to use this vocabulary, but we no longer believe in the assumptions that give it meaning. So we are confused. You remember that the narrator says in Proust, we are friends with those whose ideas are at the same level of confusion as our own. This is the principle of alliance of, uh, in politics and remains so. And this then is the situation. So for example, if you take that binary idea of politics, Real change, fundamental change, is always the substitution of one regime by another. If it's not that, it's not fundamental. But suppose our situation is such that that kind of change isn't in the cards for us. It's not on the horizon. And if it were on the horizon, we would be afraid of it because it would be too dangerous then what's left to do? What's left to do is to humanize. It's to humanize the inevitable, which is what the progressives do. So in this way, the idea of the revolutionary substitution has been converted into its opposite, or into a pretext for its opposite. Because fundamental change is not feasible, is not accessible, what remains to do is to humanize the existing world. That's the agenda of the progressives. So we would have to reconstruct this opposition between the right and the left, the conservatives and the progressives, in both of its components. So first, the goal. If the goal is not shallow equality, the goal should be deep freedom. Now, what, by, what I mean by deep freedom is this ascent to a higher form of life for common humanity, that we could all become bigger together somehow. And the second component is in the transformation of the structural presuppositions. We would insist that, yes, the structures of social life are artifacts. We made them, and we imagine them. They, they are us. They are projections of us. But none of these assumptions about their necessity is true. And we would have to begin developing a different way of thinking and talking about structure and structural alternatives and structural discontinuity in history. Now, before I pause, I want to comment further on each of these two components, the goal and the practice. 
And I want to suggest a philosophical elucidation of this idea of becoming bigger together. Now, there are many possible ways of elucidating it philosophically. And there's never any one-to-one -one relation between a philosophical idea and a programmatic agenda. Any programmatic agenda we're thinking about should be susceptible to elucidation in a whole range of alternative philosophical ideas. And I'm just going to give you an example of one. So freedom, what is freedom? This, this entrance into life, this possession of life, all we have is life right now in the moment. And how do we become free? We become free by resolving a series of contradictions. And here are three such contradictions. The first of them has to do with the relation between the self the individual human being, and other people. No one can be free alone. We are free only in connection with the others. But every connection threatens us with subjugation and with the loss of personal distinction. And thus there seems to be a contradiction between these two conditions of self-assertion, that, that we connect, but that somehow we connect without being subjugated. And where or how do we have an experience of connection without subjugation? We have it, for example, in personal love. If the distinction between love and altruism is that in love there is an epistemic threshold to cross, the, the imagination and the acceptance of the other. It's not just a sacrificial giving, a generosity from on high or from a distance, but it's the ability to imagine the otherness of the other person. But love doesn't flourish beyond the sphere of intimacy, of intimate personal relations. That would be altruism, not love. And so we need a counterpart beyond this sphere. And what is this counterpart? It's some form of cooperation. which is completely indeterminate in its institutional force. So that's the first way in which we would become freer and bigger, that we would come more fully into the possession of life. We would be able to connect without being entangled in some scheme of social division and hierarchy that would subjugate us. Now, here's a second contradiction. It's a contradiction not between the self and other people, but the self and a particular social and cultural world. No one can be free without engaging in a real world and taking a position in a real world. But at the same time, if to engage in that world, we have to surrender to it and become its puppets. If, for example, it hands to us a script about how to act and how to feel and what to do, then we're not free. So somehow, we have to be able to engage without surrendering and to be insiders and outsiders at the same time. And society has to be organized in such a way that it will allow us to keep 
the last word for ourselves rather than giving the last word to it. And now there's this third contradiction which arises in the relation of the self to itself. To be free, we have to form a coherent mode of being, a character, a personality. But at the same time, we have to be capable of disrupting this character. The Greeks said, character is fate. And fate, if it really is fate, is the denial of our freedom. So as we grow older, a, a mummy begins to form around us of our habitual way of being and of the circumstance to which we're resigned. And in that mummy, each of us begins to die. Many small deaths. When what we should all desire if we are to be free is to die only once. So to be free, we have to be able to form this coherent way of being, but at the same time to resist it, to be able to break it up from within. And this is not just a moral achievement, but has to do with the organization of society and of culture. So that's my way of elucidating this idea of becoming bigger and becoming bigger together. And it's this notion that we becoming bigger together is a collective achievement. And it depends on the organization of society and culture. It also depends on us, because we live in biographical time, whereas politics goes on in historical time beyond the scope of a human lifetime. And so somehow morals, the conduct of life, the way we live, has to make up for the omissions and failures of politics. But that's another theme. So that's by way of elucidating the first element in this contrast. Now the second element has to do with the structure. And I was trying to, I was beginning to set up a contrast to the classical Marxist view of structure and structural determinism. So it's like a game of musical chairs, history, it's fighting. It's endless fighting over the terms of our access to one another, of our claims on one another. The music is the fighting. And when the music stops, we sit down on the chairs. The chairs are the structures. So the fighting is relatively contained and temporarily interrupted. It never stops completely. And what we call these structures, the institutions, are these truce lines that emerge when the fighting stops or to the extent that it stops. But there's no closed list of regimes. The primary form of structural change in history is not revolutionary substitution of one regime by another. That's a limiting case, and for the most part, a fantasy. The primary form of structural change is fragmentary, piecemeal, but nevertheless susceptible to becoming cumulative, to marching in a particular direction. Now, why is it that some regimes prevail over others? There's a functional element. There's no one-to-one -one relation between a set of institutional arrangements and some functional advantage 
having more capacity to create wealth or to exert military power. The same functional advantages can be based always on alternative institutional arrangements. There's always more than one way. But nevertheless, there is a functional element. And some regimes are more successful than others in achieving these functional advantages. But they don't select from some laboratory, from some menu of possible options in history. They select from the options that are available, from what's close by, from the historical legacy, and then they expand. Now, there's one more thing to say about these arrangements, which is also not recognized in the legacy of Marxist theory. The extent to which the structures are there, as if they were natural objects, like the atomic structure of a physical phenomenon, is itself variable. Because these institutional arrangements can be organized in a way that entrenches them against challenge and change, and in this sense, allows them to confer on themselves this mendacious semblance of naturalness and necessity, or on the contrary, lays themselves open to transformation. They can facilitate their own revision. And these would be, we might think, the higher forms of political, economic, and social life. The ones which allow us to engage in them without surrendering them to them to be insiders and outsiders at the same time. So these are all just vague suggestions by which we begin to make out the program of forming a way of thinking and talking about structure and structural alternatives. And that way of thinking about structure and structural alternatives then would have to be married in this alternative view of what it means to be a progressive or a leftist with the goal, the goal of ascent to a higher form of life, a shared ascent, rather than the ascent of a privileged minority. So that's an example, or that's a proposal, for the reconstruction of our understanding of the distinction between right and left of progressive and conservative as an alternative to simply abandoning it and saying it doesn't make sense anymore. It's lost its meaning. We would have to give it another meaning to breathe new life and new meaning into it, but through some active reconstruction. Now, I've said, I've said quite a lot there uh, in this first set of comments, so let me stop and ask, ask for your engagement, whether someone would like to speak to any part of this first set of ideas. Yes? Yes. Uh, that, so I gave that as an example of a philosophical conception that elucidates the idea of becoming bigger together. Well, I'm not sure what's implied in the reference to Hegel, so I'm not sure whether to say yes or no. Uh, so you have to tell me more.
Well, yes, but there was a lot more in Hegel. So for example, Hegel had the idea that we start with a, with a moment in history in which we have subjectivity, uh, we, we, in which we don't have subjectivity. We have a complete identification with the established form of social life. And then we, we go through a long detour, a long purgatory, in which the spirit is estranged from the social world. And then through the resolution of a series of contradictions, we arrive at a final moment in which we find freedom in society. So we now, subjectivity has been aroused, awakened in us, but it is no longer estranged from the social world because we have real objective freedom. I'm not describing anything like that. So in that sense, it's not Hegelian at all. Uh, it's, I suppose it, it, it's, it has a dialectical element because it focuses on contradiction. So in the particular philosophical program that I, conception that I offered as an elucidation of this idea of becoming bigger together, our experience of being free is complicated because there are these tensions that we have to resolve or at least diminish through the way in which we live and through the way in which we organize society. And we won't be free except to the extent that we resolve these tensions, that we master them in some way. That's what I was saying. Uh, and so, as in this example, that we have to connect, but we have to connect without being subjugated. And we have to engage, but we have to engage without surrendering. We have to form a coherent personality, but we can't allow it to take us over. Uh, so that's all that's saying. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialectical conception. It's saying our, our idea of freedom, of freedom is vitality, is entering into the possession of life. And it's what, 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 that, what those ideas are saying is that this idea of freedom is complicated and is full of inner tension that we resolve or fail to resolve in morals and in politics. And I was just focusing on the political side of that. That was, that was the spirit of those remarks. But I insist. There's nothing sacrosanct about this particular way of elucidating the idea of shared bigness and of freedom. That's just an example. And there's a whole set of ways in which we might elucidate that conception. But it's very different from this paradoxical position of the contemporary progressive saying, we're the egalitarians. Uh, and then you open their books, and the strange thing is it's not very revolutionary at all. So it's like, what is the Rawlsian theory of justice? It's a philosophical gloss on the very homely practice under compensatory social democracy of attenuating inequalities generated in the market retrospectively through progressive taxation and social entitlements, uh, accepting more or less by default the established and inherited institutional arrangements. And this is characteristic, then, of a large part of political theory. So the vast majority of the political philosophers all agree about the bottom line. The bottom line is some form of liberal social democracy. 
which humanizes the market order and makes it less unequal. The only thing they disagree about is the top line. In what by what philosophical contraption, in what philosophical vocabulary are, are they to arrive at the same conclusion at which they've already arrived? They've already agreed about the conclusion. The only thing they disagree about is how they're going to get there. And you could, you could say, well, this, this, is, this is a kind of window dressing. This is not philosophy. Because philosophy is like religion or art. It's a storm that picks you up and takes you in a direction that you didn't intend to go. And if it's not that, we don't need it. That's, that's what we need it for. And uh, so it's not what it seems to be. Yes. I do mean it to, it to have a spiritual connotation, uh, if I, because it has to do with our conception of the scope of human existence. Are we small or aren't we small? Let's, let, me, let me give you a, a, a tangible example. So let's take in the Second World War. The Second World War was the most terrible and total military conflict that humanity has ever experienced. And tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people died. There was terrible suffering. In all the belligerent powers during the Second World War, on both sides, on all sides, rates of suicide and depression fell precipitously during the Second World War. And as soon as universal peace was reestablished, those rates rose again. Now, I don't know whether this is something good or something terrible, but it says, but what it suggests is that we're not what we seem to be. And the human being wants to live for something greater than himself. And he wants to be able to forget himself. And unless he can forget himself and lose himself in some larger task, in some larger endeavor, he's not fully human. And he's not, in some deep sense, happy. So that conception, I, I, I think I have to say, it is spiritual. It has to do with an idea of, of, of our largeness. and and. Before we go, before we descend into the into the grave, can we all have a taste of a larger life, of a greater freedom, or is that reserved for a small elite of humanity? That's the question that's raised in this contrast, and that's much more significant ultimately than just how we distribute the pie of material benefits. The distribution of the pie of material benefits is, of course, not irrelevant. It is very relevant because it helps shape the quality of our relations to one another. But it is not the ultimate object of the contest, which is, is more fundamental. And now I think, just speaking as a matter of the history of ideas, what I would say is that not just for the liberals, but for the socialists like Marx, the real object is freedom. And what is human freedom? The real object is not who gets what and how much does each one get, but what does this mean for us? And uh, so I think that's what's, in, that's what's in question. So in this contrast, that I, in this alternative way of thinking that I proposed, of this alternative way of contrasting the progressives and the conservatives, the left and the right, uh, a characteristic complaint that the conservatives would make of the right or of, of the left, of the progressives, is that this is a form of romanticism. 
this is uh, in, in, in direct response to your question, this, they would say, you're seeking salvation in politics. And politics is no place to look for salvation. Politics is about cold, marginal gains in equity and efficiency. It's not about salvation. And the answer of the, the, the radical is that if you're going to look for salvation anywhere, you have to look for it everywhere. And there, it's not possible to cordon off our collective life from the rest of our aspirations. So this diminished contrast of shallow equality and shallow freedom as the central mechanism of ideological conflict has as one of its presuppositions what you could call the privatization of the sublime. So what is sublime? Religion, art, our personal experiences, everything is internalized in what Max Weber called the pianissimo of personal life. And separated from this objective world of the forces. So that's what's in question. Yes. Well, that's a question of a different order, and to which I hesitate to answer, because it's very loaded. There's a huge historical baggage, for example. To what extent are our ideas about social transformation informed by Christianity, or more generally, by the religions of the Bible, or not? And secularizations, or not, of a larger idea it's too complicated to answer that in a formula, because uh, there, is an, there is a very profound connection to these religious traditions. But I don't think we do justice to that connection by using terms like secularization, as if it were simply the translation of a Christian vision into a discourse about history. There's much more involved in that. It's a much more complicated operation. But what is the case is that this is a, an expansion of, of the terms of politics uh, in, in, to much larger than we are, are now accustomed to by this established discourse of shallow equality against shallow freedom. Yes? Well, first of all, let, let me say something right at the outset. You say a central premise of ours it's a premise of mine. So, so I, I'm, I'm not, I, what I, I'm going to try and do here something which is totally against the grain, which is I am going to stand up for the idea that there is a progressive alternative. And I'm going to present a view of what it is. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend that it's like a dialogue of all possible views or something. And I'm, not, and I'm not out to convince you uh, of, of, of anything. My hope is that I can seize on a subject which is very difficult and I'm promising forcefully and present a particular view and that you'll resist me in all sorts of ways. But, I, but there's no assumption that I am, so that we're in this together as if we're some kind of movement or party that we're forming here in a particular direction. I have no reason to believe that. Uh, and uh, 
that, that's definitely not what I'm doing here. But go on. Well, I mean, let, let, let me expand that somewhat so, and say, so I'm interested in the discussion of alternatives around the world in different societies, in my own country, in Brazil, but also in many other countries. Now, there is a characteristic experience today in the world of anyone who tries to discuss alternatives. And the experience is this. If I propose something to you which is far from what exists, you will say, that's very interesting, but it's clearly utopian. If I propose something that's close to what exists, you'll say that's feasible, but it's trivial. And almost anything that can be proposed in the current climate of opinion is likely to be dismissed as either trivial or utopian. Now, I think that this is a false dilemma. And it arises in the first place from a misunderstanding of the nature of transformation and of a programmatic argument. Thinking that it's <coughs> about blueprints when, in fact, it's about successions. It's about a sequence of steps of how we get from, from there to there from here. Uh, but what aggravates it and lends it enormous intellectual interest is that it, it is overdetermined. The reason why we face this dilemma in the world today is that we don't have a credible, usable way of thinking and talking about structural alternatives, structural discontinuity, structural transformation. And therefore, we fall back on a substitute and evidently false conception of political realism that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it approximates what already exists. But that's that's not an idea that is informed by any notion of transformation. It's informed by an inability to understand transformation. Because to, to understand any phenomenon in nature or in society is to understand what it can become. That's what it means to understand it. And insight is always either transformative or doesn't exist. Uh, insight not into the ultimate possible, but the adjacent possible. What can happen next? What this can turn into? The way in which I understand a phenomenon in the world is by grasping what it can become under certain provocations or certain interventions. If I don't understand that, I don't understand it at all. So. Uh, <coughs> then this is the, the core experience from which I'm beginning. The confusion, the difficulty about thinking programmatically and thinking about the transformation of a structure into another structure. So uh, if I can't do that, I'm not free, going back now to the idea of freedom. I have no way of engaging the world critically and transformatively. So that's something which is, in, in addition, as it were, it's something more than just situating myself in a historical tradition of progressives or of leftists. It's, it's, uh, the, the real question is whether we can think about transformation or not. Yes.
Well, you have to say one more thing, which is what would make the better structure better, which is what I was trying to do through this discourse about shared bigness. Uh, because you could have a revolutionary rightism, as, as the Nazi movement was in form, uh, a revolutionary movement. Uh, so you have to say more than that to get to the outcome that we want. Yes. Yes, you. Yes. So you'll have to say a little bit more so I understand where you're going. So, so is, is, the f is the focus now on whether there's a convergent ascent as opposed to many evolutionary lines? Is it, is it about plurality as, as distinct from convergence? Well, we're not talking about history ascending. We're talking about we ascending or not. That is, the, there's a subject. The subject is the human being, the ordinary human being. Can we, ordinary humanity, can we ar arise? Can we become bigger? Can we have larger lives? That's, that's the way in which I formulated the question. It's, it's, it's about the dignity of the ordinary, of common humanity and its capacity to reach to a larger life. It's not about, it, the subject of, of these sentences is not history. The subject is us. So, and that's a, that's a difference between this and, for example, Marxism. Because in Marxism, the subject is history. History has a plan for us. History has a script. And, the, the script is already written out. Well, if it's written out, we don't need to have a programmatic vision. Well, that's fair, because, of course, the vocabulary in which I elucidated this idea of shared bigness is taken from philosophical traditions of the West and ideas of autonomy. And these ideas of autonomy can be criticized because of their relative emptiness, as I think you were just suggesting. So it's like Lear says, I, I shall do such things, I know not what, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. So we have all this autonomy, this bigness, and then you can legitimately ask, what is it for? Uh, and so that's, a, that's, a, that's the beginning of an argument. But it's still the case that this is not about history. It's about us and, and what, what we are going to do. And then... Uh, And then there are these nations, because there's this, I thought this was implicit in your remark just now, this question of the diversity of forms of life, of national experiences in the world, that they may be going in different directions.
So this touches on another subject, which, is, which I haven't addressed in this initial statement, which is this question now, a subject radically understated in Marx, the subject of, na of nations and nationalism. So the nations of the world used to be like tribes. Uh, they were organized on a basis of uh, like families of families, similarity of experience and actual biological connection. And then they are developing now in the world into something else, into what you, they are experiments in different ways of being human a kind of moral specialization within humanity. And you could say, taking up this Im implicit theme of pluralism, there's no one way, there's no natural way of being human. There are different ways. And the nations of the world are these different experiments in ways of being human. And if the experiments are not to be just folklore, they must be embodied in tangible institutional arrangements. There's the differences in culture, in moral culture, must have an expression in the organization of society. Uh, now, in this pathway from the families to the moral specialization, from the tribes to the moral specialization, an accident has taken place. And the accident is that the different nations of the world emulate one another. They go around the world, they, 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 they look for what works to preserve their national independence and military power. And in order to succeed in this worldwide struggle, this worldwide competition and emulation, they raid one another. So they have to tear out part of their collective identity. For the ancient Romans, to be a Roman meant to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans the tangible identity, and what is tangible can be compromised. And in this new conception, which arises in what I'm calling the accident, the tangible collective identities are hollowed out. And so it happens that two nations live side by side, and they come to hate each other, not because they are different, but because they are becoming alike and because they want to be different. So it's this impotent rage for identity, for a collective separateness, which has no tangible expression. And it can't be compromised, because if it were a concrete set of customs, it's porous and susceptible to compromise. But it's, if it's the assertion of an abstract identity, it's an intransigent belief in collective distinction that is not susceptible to compromise. Now, then, there are three possible responses to this situation. So one response is the response of liberal cosmopolitanism, which is to deny the validity of this desire for distinction. The second is the response of reactionary nationalism, autarkic nationalism, return to the tangible collective identity. But the third is the response that I would take to be the leftist or progressive response. And it would say, what we should do with this desire for difference is not to suppress it, but to equip it. So we should create the political and economic institutions that allow these different nations to create 
new difference, to become more different. And the difference that matters most is the difference that will be created in the future, not the difference that has been inherited from the past. And then we will, we will become then, humanity will become this, this great engine for the creation of new difference, of novelty, of divergence. So it's not an idea necessarily of, of a single ascent. That's how I would elucidate this through bringing in the theme of the nation into, in, into the discussion. And so then already this idea of becoming bigger together is more complicated because there isn't one way of becoming bigger together. But there are these many different ways. And th the way we might want to think is to say, difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. And what we want to do with this desire for collective distinction is to provide it with institutional instruments, such as a, a, a high energy democracy that can create new distinctions, not to suppress it. So, I, so uh, I don't see any contradiction with the spirit of your question. Uh, I, and I would want to develop the argument in that direction. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure. So, and this is a very interesting question, of course, because what is the what is the back, what is the disciplinary background of this discourse of mine? I don't know the answer to that question. It has no disciplinary background because, and why is that? It's because. All the contemporary social sciences, each in, its, in a different way, have suppressed the structural imagination, the idea of thinking about structure. Each social science has broken in a different way the link between insight into the existent and imagination of the adjacent possible. Now, classical social theory, I gave the example of Marxism, had a view, but it's a view that has become literally unbelievable. We can't believe it, but it's the only view we have. And now we have these contemporary social sciences that have broken the link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. They have no, they suppress the structural imagination. So, uh, I would say to have this programmatic discourse, you need a political science, but not the political science that we, that we have. You need an economics, but different from the economics that actually exists, and so forth. So the effort to think programmatically in the spirit that I'm proposing is in tension with the established discipline. And I can't disguise that. But that's how I see things. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons to do this in a circumstance like this one, because this is not a political circumstance. And so it's programmatic thought is an incitement to thinking about the actual in a way that's different from the way that is made available to us by the particular social sciences. That's what I would say. And so when you ask your question is, what discipline should I consult? My half facetious answer to you is, consult only the disciplines that don't exist. And, uh, but that's, but that's, the, that's the 
situation, which, which I believe to be actually the case. Yes? Well, that's how all changes are. I mean, take, so next week we're going to discuss the United States. So Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. It, it had many, diff many different stages. It went through all sorts of transformations. But all along the way, there were these experiments. And Roosevelt himself said, I don't know what to do, <laughs> but I believe in experimenting. And, and I'll try everything. Uh, and that was the spirit. So what I would say is that these are the real transformations in history. And in any political transformation, the meaning of it depends on what happens next. So the meaning of a political, every political move, every fragmentary reform, can be seen as a way of fending off a more fundamental transformation, or it can be seen as a step to the next transformation. And that's not predetermined by what it is. So its meaning is determined by its sequel. And that's just how politics is. And then, so we have to have a way of thinking about these transformations that does justice to that ambiguity. Yes. Well, there's a, because in the New Deal, well, we, we have to distinguish different phases of the New Deal. So uh, at the beginning of the New Deal, for example, there was an institutional idea. It's not an idea with which I sympathize, but it was an institutional idea that the American economy should be reorganized on the basis of concerted action, collaboration, between the government and private business, orchestrated between, between, between the government and labor, orchestrated by the national government. And then there was a narrowing funnel to a focus on the provision of antidotes to economic insecurity, of which the most salient example was the Social Security program. And then there was the remarkable experience of the war economy, during which the United States was radically reorganized and in a way which contemporary Americans couldn't even imagine possible. Uh, and then at the very end uh, of the war, after Roosevelt's death, uh, there was the normalization of a consumption-driven economy in which it was the democratization of purchasing power became the central theme. So these were different things, but each of them was a structural intervention, some much more significant and promising than others. Uh, none of them addressed the fundamental issue of the democratization of economic power on the, on the, in the production system, the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, which is the problem that the United States and other contemporary democracies face today. There's a vanguard, there's a new vanguard, which we call the knowledge economy, but it's an island, which excludes the vast majority of workers and their businesses. Everyone else is condemned to some kind of make work. And so what would be a structural change? It would be something that transformed that that disseminated the knowledge economy out of its islands, took it out of this quarantine, deepened it, and spread it at an economy-wide basis. And the measures by which that would be done would all be fragmentary, but they would be structural. They would have a large structural significance. Sure. Yes.
Yes. Um, the reason people see the symbol of a conservative identity, in order to, be because I imagine that might be like that for you being from the other side, but I imagine a higher form of conservative. <coughs> and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. If you well, I'm not sure because as we, as I discussed in response to one of the comments here. Uh, there can be a right-wing structural transformation. That's not what conservatism now ordinarily is. So it's the attempt to preserve the established structure rather than the attempt to reinvent it in some fundamental way. But there could be, yes, but there could be. And uh, now I think this is a good moment for me to at least begin the second approach to the distinction between conservative and progressive, which is a completely different nature. So the first one is this philosophical distinction between two ways of distinguishing progressives and conservatives. The progressives are the ones who think that it's not, no, not natural for human life to be small. And the conservatives are the ones who think that it is. The progressives are the ones who insist on looking beyond the present structure. The conservatives are the ones who don't. But there's another way of understanding now the distinction between the progressives and the conservatives that is much closer to our historical reality. So for almost 100 years now, there has been a default position for the progressives. The default position is social democracy or social liberalism, which was the, the, the compromise in political economy articulated especially in the years immediately after the Second World War, but already prefigured before the First World War. Now, if you asked in the world, what's the most popular system of political economy? What country would the world like to become? The answer is very clear. It, the world would like to become Sweden but not the real Sweden, the mythical Sweden. So uh, the real Sweden, there were many decades in the 20th century of struggle between the social democratic governments and the familial plutocracy that can, that to this day, owns most of the Swedish economy. And it ended in a compromise. And on that compromise, the plutocracy was allowed to preserve its, its stake in the productive assets, but had to cede part of its power to the state. And the state then organized this system of redistribution. So the world doesn't see the prologue. It just sees the epilogue of the system of social entitlements. So it would like to have just, this is the imaginary, what I'm calling the imaginary Sweden, just the sequel of the system of universalistic social entitlements without the prologue of all that struggle between the state and the, uh, and the plutocratic oligarchs that preceded it. So what is the essence of social democracy, of the social democratic or social liberal compromise? It had a counterpart in the United States. The counterpart in the United States we'll discuss next week was Roosevelt's New Deal. We, we can understand it as a, <coughs> as a kind of bargain. The forces that threatened to reorganize power and production renounced this challenge. 
renounced the challenge that they had presented, especially during the years that immediately followed the First World War. And in exchange, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively, to redistribute retrospectively through tax and transfer policies, progressive taxation and redistributive social spending, and to manage the economy countercyclically through fiscal and monetary policy. That was the compromise. So the market order and representative democracy in its inherited form were preserved. And in exchange, the state was allowed to acquire these corrective powers, the main significance of which was to allow for the attenuation of inequalities generated in the market order by these corrective and redistributive means. That was the essence of the social democratic compromise. Now, if we, to have an unsentimental view of this compromise, you could say, not as its friends would like to see it, but as it really was, you could say, in its historical origins, it was composed of three main parts. So first, there were a set of safeguards of insiders against outsiders. So in the labor market, workers with stable, relatively privileged jobs in the capital-intensive parts of the economy, as opposed to everyone else. In the market for corporate control, corporate insiders, incumbents against challengers. And in the product markets, generally, uh, small business against big business. Second, there was a commitment to organize comprehensive deals between big business and organized labor orchestrated by national governments. Social contracts also labeled incomes policy. And third, there was the financing of a high level of social entitlements, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, a regressive form of taxation funding progressive social entitlements. So that's what, in its historical reality, classical social democracy was. And to make a long story short, what happened to it? What happened to it is that it gave up, little by little, the first two sets of arrangements. The safeguards for insiders against outsiders, and these social contracts or incomes policy these deals between big business and organized labor. It gave them up because they were inefficient and because they were unfair to the majority of outsiders. It gave them up and it retreated historical social democracy to the last line of defense, the third set of arrangements the high level of redistributive social entitlements paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. So that's what social democracy became. It was hollowed out, it was liberalized, and the predominant aim of the elites, of the business and political elites in the rich North Atlantic countries on both sides of the Atlantic became to combine 
the social protection of the Europeans with the economic flexibility of the Americans. That became the ideal. And that is the default version of the progressive position today. That's what it is. It's this liberalized, hollowed out form of social democracy. That's what remains. So if we come down, as it were, to earth from this heaven of the philosophical conceptions and attempt to provide an earthly description of the progressive reality, that's what it is. And uh, one social democracy has been hollowed out in this form. And what's the trouble? Why, wh what's the problem with this? It cannot solve or even address any of the fundamental structural problems of these societies. And that's why the hegemony of the center-right and center-left parties, which represent social democracy or social liberalism, has been subject successfully challenged by right-wing populism. So what are the problems that are unsolved by this diminished, hollowed out form of the social democratic or social liberal compromise? The first and most fundamental problem is the problem of the hierarchical segmentation of the production system in the age of the knowledge economy. So there's a new productive vanguard. It's no longer conventional industry, industrial mass production. It's what we call the knowledge economy. And Uh, dedicated to permanent innovation and experimentalism, approximating productive activity to scientific discovery, and heightening the level of discretionary initiative and reciprocal trust expected and demanded of all participants in the process of production. And this knowledge economy is not just high-tech manufacturing. It's not just the platform oligopolies as in the United States. It exists in every sector of the major economies of the world. However, in each sector, it is an island, a fringe, that excludes the vast majority of workers and businesses. And as the chasm between the vanguard and the rear guard has deepened, a larger part of the labor force has been consigned to precarious, unstable employment, radical economic insecurity, under the euphemism of economic flexibility. And the economy has been financialized meaning that finance has developed what you could call a parasitic or predatory relation to the system of production. It's indifferent to the production system in good times. It's destructive in bad times. The production system is largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. And the activity, the financial activity then principle would be most important, which would be the financing of the creation of new assets in new ways, as in venture capital, is a minuscule part of the total activity of the capital market. So this is the reality of this, this system. And the hollowed out, liberalized, social democratic compromise has been unable to address the consequences of this situation. 
First of all, it's consequences for economic stagnation, for slowdown. The slowing of economic growth and of the rise of productivity and the deepening of inequality. The inequality is anchored in the hierarchical segmentation of the production system. It has a structural basis. And no measure of compensatory redistribution would be enough. The compensatory redistribution would have to be massive to fix these inequalities. And long before it reached the requisite dimension to address the inequalities, it would begin to destabilize the economy because it contradicts the logic of the established economic arrangements and incentives. So the, the repertoire of historical social democracy of compensatory redistribution is not good enough to address this problem. It is a structural problem that can have only structural solutions. Now, a second problem of historical so of this social democracy has to do with the basis of social cohesion. And this is very clearly illustrated, more clearly illustrated in the case of the European social democracies. Taking again the case of Sweden. So the only basis of social cohesion in the social, in the social democratic state was money transfers organized by the state. So the state hires people to take care of other people and so forth. Against the background of a very high degree of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. When migratory flows and other forms of interaction among these countries erode the basis of ethnic and cultural homogeneity, the inadequacy of money as a social cement becomes manifest. And so there are all these troubles in these, in these countries. Money is not good enough. The only adequate social cement is the multiplication of forms of collective action people doing many things together. Nothing else works. And now there's a third problem. And the third problem is the capacity to change. The extent to which democratic politics are organized to render structural transformation possible. Now, the real rhythm of European life in the 20th century has been that transformation happens when there is war. So in war, the Europeans wake up. And then when peace is reestablished, they go back to sleep and drown their sorrows in consumption. And this, and because the, the, the political life is not organized, to sustain a high level of popular political engagement, of organized popular political engagement, and to rapidly resolve impasse so that politics becomes a device for the acceleration of change, and to combine strong central initiative with radical devolution at the local level. So that as the government, so that as society takes a certain road, Different parts of it can experiment with alternative versions of the national future. That's what hasn't happened. And we have in these advanced Western societies a form of political life that has shown itself incapable of producing or facilitating transformation unless there is crisis as the enabling circumstance of transformation. So crisis has to be the midwife. It has to be there to make possible transformation. Otherwise, there's no transformation. So these are three examples of the, the, what I'm calling the structural problems 
that the hollowed out liberalized form of social democracy cannot resolve. And so now we have a second definition of what it means to be a progressive or a conservative. So who are the conservatives? The conservatives are the ones who say, we, we, we can't see, we won't see, we shouldn't see beyond this situation. This is our historical fate. This is the reality. We can't go beyond it. And this liberalized form of social democracy is the best that we can hope for and seek to achieve. The progressives would be the ones who say, no, we can, we must, we can't resolve any of our structural problems within this straitjacket. We have to go further. Now, there's a problem, of course, with this alternative way of defining the contrast between a progressive and conservative. That by this definition that I'm now giving, which is much more concrete than my earlier philosophical definition, who were the progressives? It's like the progressives are, are conservatives. Most of the real progressives, those, that's all that exists. That I've just classified the social democratic parties in the, in the conservative part of my taxonomy under this classification. But that's what I intend. So uh, that's the other definition of, what it, of, of the difference between a progressive and conservative. The, the conservatives are the ones who accept hollowed out social democracy as the neck plus ultra, as the limit of historical ambition. And the progressives are the ones who don't. But then you tell me, are there any progressives? So uh, this is then the second part of my commentary. We still have some time left to discuss it. Yes. Yes. Can I interrupt you there, just, just so I can give a commentary so the, the class is not too scandalized by this citation. Uh, so uh, wh what I'm referring to is there is this, that the, a characteristic position of the progressives, now thinking, for example, of progressive economists, is they believe that the, that the orthodoxy called neoliberalism or the Washington Consensus is universal. But the heresies, the effect of heresies are local. So there's the Chinese way, the Brazilian way, and so forth. So these local heresies are composed of pieces of the universal orthodoxy combined with local variations or adaptations. That's this idea. And I am then, in this imaginary historical dialogue, standing with John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx and saying, no, that's not how you can successfully combat a universalizing orthodoxy. A universalizing orthodoxy can be successfully combated only by a universalizing heresy. But a universalizing heresy is not necessarily committed to the idea of a single path. As I just illustrated in the exchange we had about nation, there can be difference, there can be divergence, but on the basis of a different set of ideas.
failure of the American left to provide support to the Cold War and the Soviet Union. And I wonder whether that is the failure of our collective imagination, or rather over reliance on the sort of centralized, top down theory of news and seeking some sort of universal credibility. And I think my question for the final time on it is are you putting the cart before the horse? I don't think those two things are opposed. Okay. Uh, so I think they complement each other. And just to take today's discussion, uh, I, I had two approaches to the distinction between conservative and progressive, one from the top and the other, as it were, from the historical circumstance. Now, if you ask me which of these is more natural, which of these has priority in the arguments of humanity. It's obviously the second, not the first. The first is something you come to after long elaboration and reflection uh, and a, a great ambition, of transformative ambition. But it's in no sense natural. The natural thing would be to say, we have a problem here that we have to solve. This problem, for example, of the insular knowledge economy. It's a drag on the economic growth of the country. Look at the United States. What is the growth strategy of the United States? It has only one growth strategy. It can be summarized in two words, easy money. And this growth strategy is not implemented by the national government in the United States. It's implemented by the central bank. And then they keep complaining about the central bank. It's gone too far. It's not gone too far enough. That's the whole discussion of economic growth in the United States. So. That's how you would begin. What you would begin from that, well, what's the alternative? The alternative is not to have our most advanced form of production confined to this archipelago of islands, of fringes, from which the vast majority of Americans are excluded. They're all assigned to some kind of make work. And meanwhile, this tiny, this tiny, this tiny elite is, is, uh, 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 is, is in, the com in control of the commanding heights of the knowledge economy. So that's an example of a problem that has to be solved. So I, speak, speaking from my position now, as someone who is committed to, to thought, to theory, I don't believe that there's an, op an opposition between this perspective from the bottom up and the large ambitions that I share with John Stuart Mill or Karl Marx or so forth. It's all the same thing. But it's, it's only the same thing if you have enough time. So, you know, Wittgenstein said, when one philosopher greets another, his salutation is, take your time. And we're in this situation in which we have this artificial structure here of these classes that meet 12, 13 classes in a semester. And it's obviously impossible because it's a discussion that should continue for many hours and uh, if we had enough patience for it. So that's my perspective. And all I can do is point along the way to these larger horizons in our, in our argument. But I do insist that the, the most natural perspective is not this philosophical perspective. It's a perspective that begins from below. So that's what's natural. We, we have this problem, and it has to be fixed. But the problem is not unrelated to our ultimate ambitions, including our spiritual ambitions, I would say. Yes.
Yeah, so uh, it's a very complicated question. Uh, but, uh, and I think it's a question that is related to these issues that we're discussing. Because what is not duly appreciated is that there's no sustainable form of production that's possible without being highly advanced. There's sustainable production is either very primitive or very advanced. And there's nothing in between. So I think of that in relation to the problem we have in Brazil in the Amazon. So people think the Amazon should be kept as a park for the benefit of humanity. It won't be kept as a park. There are 25 million people there. And if they don't have 